Good afternoon and welcome to the September meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, please help me start the meeting by honoring our country and stating the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have five trustees present in the chambers, and trustees Cook and Lawson are participating by Zoom. How about Cross? Cross. Trustee Cross. What did I say? Trustee said, Cross yeah. and Trustee Lawson are participating uh, by Zoom. Um, this is an open meeting uh, pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act using Zoom and limited attendance in the uh, board chambers uh, so that everybody can observe uh, the actions of the board today. Uh, so we have a quorum with all seven members present. And I'm, I'm asking that, I, I don't see Trustee Lawson on my screen in front of me, but I saw her earlier. So I think she's everybody is. She is on. She's on, okay. Um, awards and recognitions, we have none uh, to present tonight. So we will move uh, into the open forum. The open forum section of uh, the board agenda is a time for members of the community to comment to the board. There will be one open forum period during every regularly scheduled uh, board of trustees meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless there are numerous speakers, in which case the chair can limit that to three minutes per speaker. In order to be recognized um, in our Zoom format, uh, speakers must register by 5 p.m. Uh, the Wednesday before our Thursday meeting. Um, and then they will be recognized and there will be some delay be between when I recognize them and when they are uh, granted speaker privileges by our technical staff. When addressing the board, uh, registered speakers are asked to be respectful and are encouraged to, encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting to matters where the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are under, otherwise addressed through established grievance processes or are otherwise subject to review by the college or the board. Today we have two registered speakers, so each will be allowed five minutes. Uh, the first registered speaker is Ashley Hooley. Ashley, when you uh, are indicated you have the speaker privileges, would you give your name and address and we'd be happy to hear your comments. Yes, hello, my name is Ashley Hooley, like Ty. I live at 18205 West 159th Terrace in Olathe, and I am a current Johnson County student. Please go ahead with your comments. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, hello. Uh, I am currently the College Election Engagement Program Fellow for Johnson County Community College. I'm here to speak to you regarding a statement of support for a political science certificate here at JCC. Although this board is typically the last to approve curriculum changes, my hope is that the support of this board can overcome the challenges that have beleaguered this process previously. The first question you might be asking is, why do we need this? The answer is because political science is a specialized foundation for future career paths. Whether a student enters the workforce after JCCC or transfers onto a four-year program, these specific skills are needed to advance those goals. The current degree programs do not meet these needs. The current degree plans currently require a student to use most of their elective credits to take the political science coursework we offer, which is a barrier for students who do not immediately choose the political science field. Students often rely on JCCC to prepare them for their future degrees and careers. This includes access to internships or other needed experience for their field. The lack of a political science major is a barrier to students as they seek out internships or other positions. Political science is also often pursued by pre-law students, some of which are already considering JCCC due to our excellent criminal justice coursework. The courses that are required as prerequisites for many of the political science programs that we feed to are already taught here. Now, as many of the certificates here are 30 credit hours, the question arises, which 10 courses would be included? Optimally, the certificate would allow students to pursue the specialized political science courses available with the option to follow a different major track within the certificate. 
as political science does lead to multiple specialized careers. An example of this would be for students that are pursuing pre-law to be able to choose their final course or two from sociology or criminal justice, while political science students proceed into our specialized political science courses. Although suggested certificates, such as the one I'm about to outline, can be made, the best path is, as always, to listen to faculty recommendations. This is why I reached out to current faculty for these recommendations. Endless thanks to Professors View and Easley Geraldo on their assistance. Uh, a suggested certificate would include our political science courses, American National Government, Intro to Comparative Government, International Relations, and Political Theory, as well as offering several possible tracks, including Law and Criminal Justice, which would pair nicely with degree programs offered by some of our partner schools foreign policy, uh, research methods and data analytics, or environmental politics and policy. These are merely suggested and it would require faculty input to finalize courses. Any planning must include how the courses would transfer, however. In addition to the transfer agreements JCCC already has in place, several of the suggested courses, including all of the base courses for the suggested certificate I outlined, are part of the Kansas Board of Regents seamless transfer. Finally, when it comes to transferring, we want to ensure that we are preparing students for admittance into their chosen majors. The base courses or the outline degree, or the outline certificate, my apologies, uh, covers the prerequisites for University of Kansas, for Kansas State, for many of the four-year programs that we feel. Thank you for your time. Ashley, thank you very much. Um, I know that our chief academic officer, Dr. McLeod, is in the room and, and Dr. Liker from the Faculty Association. This would be an Ed Affairs view, I understand, generally working its way up through the political science department um, generally. But as a political science undergraduate, I share your belief that it is a very valuable way to learn um, how to make your way in life. So thank you very much for your time. Mr. Chair. Uh, Trustee Cross. I too was a political science undergrad. Just wanted to note. We know. It's a good presentation. It's a good presentation. Thank you, Lee. Uh, our next speaker is Chris Roselle. Chris, would you please give us your name and address and uh, you'll have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, President Baum, administration, faculty, and public. My dream is that Johnson County Community College will be a leading college in the USA with 85% of its students and graduates voting in elections as informed students and many running for office later. Thank you for your response to Crush the Vote's request. Thank you for brainstorming and implementing with you, with us. Thanks for facilitating our students becoming civically engaged, showing social responsibility. Your leadership response is very hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Again, appreciate your time and energy on that particular issue, and I know you received a response today from Dr. Bound, um, and our Crush the Vote effort will continue to go forward. Uh, there is a debate watch scheduled for the first presidential debate, which I believe is September 29th. Um, if you want to register to that, I, I'm not sure the link, but get to the President's office and we you can register. There will be small group facilitated discussions after the, the debate. It's our first effort to get people engaged um, in this year's election. All right, with that, uh, no more uh, open forum registrants. We'll move to the college lobbyist, uh, Mr. Dick Carter. Dick, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will continue with some election updates. Uh, you do already have a copy of my uh, update, and so I won't be reading through that, but there was a lot of activity today uh, and even last night uh, that uh, that was not able to be included in a report that was submitted earlier this week. So let me just provide some brief updates about, uh, about that and then answer any questions 
uh, as I'm able. Uh, as you know, or as most of you should probably know, uh, last evening there was a central committee uh, nomination election process to fill the ballot slot uh, vacated by uh, Senator Julia Lynn. And that group met uh, in DeSoto and had a two round election where um, candidate Beverly Gottsidge uh, won out over uh, candidate Ben Singer, Bing, Bing Gesser, sorry, uh, in a two round uh, vote. And so Beverly Gossage's name will appear on the ballot for Kansas Senate District 9, uh, which was formerly uh, Julia Lynn's seat. Senator Lynn will continue to serve out her term uh, through the rest of, of the uh, legislative year. Uh, and then uh, the new candidate uh, who is elected uh, in November will be sworn in with the legislature when they convene in January. The, uh, there is still a prime or a rather a general election there. Gossage will face Democrat Stacey Knoll, who has been campaigning for uh, the past year. The Governor's Council on Education met this morning uh, and unveiled a proposal to boost education resources in Kansas. This group is made up mainly of industry leaders, uh, higher education professionals, education professionals, as well as other leaders in state government. The council discussed uh, a new plan called Advantage Kansas, which contains recommendations derived in part from the McKinsey study, which was commissioned by the Department of Commerce uh, last year. There are three broad areas, and again, this is all new, and so we're sort of waiting for all of this to unfold. There are three broad areas that were discussed. Uh, Jumpstart Kansas, which would include uh, some Kansas Promise type scholarships, as well as alignment within Excel and, and Career and Tech Ed. Uh, Talent Ready Kansas, which coordinates better with industry to identify and retain a robust Kansas workforce, uh, and that would include apprenticeships. And then Opportunity Kansas, a collaborative effort amongst business and industry, higher ed institutions, and workforce boards to help promote uh, promote this plan. Uh, it's a five-year implementation goal and there would be a cost associated with it. It, it would be significant in some areas uh, and some of that would require legislative, well, it would require legislative appropriation. So we'll see where, where that uh, proposal lands. The council next meets on December 10th and they will be formalizing their report uh, which will go to the legislature uh, in uh, 2021. A little bit later this afternoon, the State Finance Council met to approve phase three of the uh, SPARC recovery funds. Um, this, more, or this afternoon, they approved $290 million uh, for phase three, and those focus areas will be on um, increased COVID testing, child care assistance, and housing stability. And the re recommendations passed unanimously. And you'll recall that the State Finance Council uh, makes financial decisions when the legislature is not in session. It's comprised of the governor, um, House and Senate leadership, including the House and Senate uh, Appropriations and Ways and Means Chairs. The Special Committee on Economic Recovery met this afternoon and received updates from uh, higher education sectors. Uh, both Kansas Association of Community College Trustees as well as the Board of Regents had representatives uh, presenting to that committee. Um, there were a number of items contained in President Flanders' uh, report to the committee that, uh, that come directly from the McKinsey study as it relates to higher education numbers, retaining grads, uh, out migration, et cetera. And um, President Flanders also discussed the engineering initiative at the university level, uh, which will include a significant price tag. And so I think it's no secret um, that uh, we will be facing uh, budget issues, significant budget issues when the legislature comes back in 2021. And so I think that anything that has a significant price tag uh, is, is going to be looked at very, very carefully. Finally, um, the future of higher ed council that I've reported on that group uh, the past, over the course of the fall, they will be meeting on Tuesday, September 22nd. Uh, their agenda is not yet available. That's the group that's been coordinated by the Board of Regents, and uh, they will also be developing some recommendations for the legislator, legislature. Both the Governor's Council and the Future of Higher Ed Council have legislators on those uh, committees or on those councils, and so there will be some level of knowledge um, already uh, by, by Kansas legislators when the uh, legislature returns in January of 2021. Mr. Chair, I would stop there and see if there are any questions that I'm able to answer. 
Thank you, Dick. Uh, questions from the chamber? Seeing none, Trustee Cross or Trustee Lawson? I see Lee shaking his head no. Uh, Angelina? Hearing none, we will move on to, thank you, Dick. The next report is from uh, Dr. Jim Liker, uh, President of the Faculty Association. Welcome, Jim. Good evening. Right, well, the Faculty Association held its monthly meeting last Thursday. The agenda was filled with two major items, a visit by Dr. Bown, who seems none the worse for wear, <laughs> and a report on the return to campus student survey. To bring you up to speed, last June the FA worked with institutional effectiveness to write a set of questions that was sent to students from the spring semester. The response rate was about 12 percent. I don't know if that's low or just normal in this age of survey fatigue, but more than 2,000 students did reply and they gave us some stuff to think about. 65% of respondents were enrolled in at least one course that required transition to online delivery. Of those, the majority marked strongly agree when asked if they were satisfied with the college's response to COVID-19 and with instructors' flexibility and timeliness of communication in adapting to virtual learning. Maybe a little surprising to some, anyway, was a thread running through the comments expressing preference for face-to-face -face classes, but also insisting that face-to-face -face shouldn't resume unless masks and social distancing are required. The report is available for closer inspection. I want to thank our two reps on the survey committee from the FA, Michelle Salvato and Jessica Garcia as well as Natalie Ullman Byers, Farrell Janab, and everyone on that team for their fine work. In one part of the findings section, students did raise a slight concern with instructor discomfort and lack of familiarity with online teaching. Since that's the kind of observation that tends to raise eyebrows and sometimes generates panicked conversations, I'm going to be proactive and address it. Faculty, of course, are individuals with different skill sets who bring a variety of strengths and challenges to our jobs. Most of us have crafted our pedagogy around those skills. While the college reserves the right to specify delivery method, um, chairs and deans, for the most part, do try to respect individual styles. One of the problems I've always had with modern educational theory is the way that it tries to convert teaching into a science with its own set of jargon and quantitative measurements. I've always seen teaching as more of an art, where the classroom is a reflection of the professor's personality, kind of like a painter in her canvas. Some of my colleagues are very comfortable with distance teaching, and they've been doing it well since at least the 1980s, when we still called it correspondence school. Others are the shyest introverts you're ever going to meet, and Luddites when it comes to technology, but when dozens of eyes face them in a classroom, they suddenly awake and they become engaged and innovative. Not all skills translate equally well into every delivery method, but the pandemic has forced us to become, all of us, into a certain kind of homogeneity. For better or worse, we're all, on, we're all online teachers now. Certainly for some who've stuck exclusively with face-to-face -face until COVID happened, Canvas and Zoom can be frustrating especially last spring when they had to adjust on the fly. I'll repeat the <coughs> ask I made last month that administration and the board show some patience and flexibility. Faculty are stressed out like everybody else, but we're figuring it out. Speaking of virtual adjustments, this last week, the Online Learning Advisory Council, what we affectionately call OLAC, <laughs> brought much needed clarification to our various course delivery systems. Last spring, the old dichotomous model of face-to-face -face versus online went away, and it was replaced by a new world, which can easily be misunderstood by students who don't always know what they're signing up for. I encountered this myself a few weeks ago when the semester began, and as department chair, I was peppered with questions from students asking frantically, what time does my Zoom class meet? My answer, it doesn't. You're in an online asynchronous course. 
Or my professor wants to drop me for non-attendance, but I'm taking it online. My answer, you're actually taking it as an online hybrid, which means there are times when you are required to show up at a live Zoom session. The patience I'm asking of you is the same patience we're trying to extend to students. We understand how confusing these terms like asynchronous and hybrid can be, and we're working on solutions. The chair of OLAC here, Easley Geraldo, has led that group to a clear set of definitions that everybody can now find on the website. We'll also be working with marketing on a message for the homepage and a video explanation of the four different delivery methods. This is another sign of how the pandemic is forcing a reboot on lots of things. Recently, Dr. McLeod sent a message to the deans which circulated through the chairs and the instruction branch explaining the need for a preemptive plan should the college have to step back to phase one. We all hope that won't happen, but with rising numbers of cases here in the Midwest, it's a reasonable request he and the IRT are making. Individuals teaching face-to-face -face this semester are working on backup plans to shift delivery method if the college has to close again. We're also making plans for individual students in those classes in case they test positive and they have to miss class for two weeks while they're in quarantine. I'm hearing from colleagues in science and the career programs that several faculty anticipated this and they began rearranging their fall classes early and teaching the face-to-face -face objectives in the first part of the semester. Thereby, if a virtual transition is necessary in October or November, it won't be quite so painful. I hope you appreciate the impact this extra preparation has on workload. Typically, an instructor prepares a course for a certain kind of delivery once. This semester or this year, that same course might require two or three preparations depending on circumstances. I'll conclude with a couple of bragging points. FA learned last week that Hugh Clark, professor of automation engineer technology, has been appointed a representative on the statewide accreditation advisory council. Basically, he'll be helping the Kansas Department of Ed build bridges between K-12 and post-secondary on matters related to vocational and technical education. FA and KNEA were approached by Ann Ma of Topeka, and we were happy to submit Yu's name. And Beth Gully, professor of English, published some of her poetry over the summer in the journal The Thorny Locust. This was not the first time Beth is one of our more prolific authors and an outstanding writing instructor. I may be reaching out to her soon for a copy of her work since I was told last month that my report seems so formal, I'm looking for ways to liven it up. <laughs> so a poetry reading might be in your near future. That will probably play well at home with the TV audience too. <laughs> that concludes my report. Thank you, Jim. Um, Try to come up with the roses as red for you, but I, I'll I'm probably, probably come back next month, maybe. Uh, questions for Dr. Liker in the chamber? Um, Trustee Cross and Trustee Lawson? Hearing none, thank you very much. I, I think your comments are from last month and this month apply to everybody, everywhere. Absolutely. Patience and flexibility as we continue this and as trustee smith ever and i were walking in together we noted that the worst part about this is you can't say hunker down for three more weeks or hunker down for three more months we just don't know and that starts to wear on everybody so um i know that everybody in this room is as anxious as you are and the rest of the faculty to see if we can find a way to get this behind us Excellent. thank you thank you uh, the next agenda item is Johnson County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Cross. Do you have a report? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, we haven't met. We will meet again on October 26th, as I've reported uh, several times. Uh, I will note that uh, Mayor Peggy Dunn did send around a revenue spreadsheet that indicated revenues are up 0.8% uh, from this time last year and uh, some 7%, nearly 7% from uh, four years ago. So uh, despite the uncertainty and uh, current events, uh, JSTIRT has been humming along. So we'll meet again on uh, October 26th, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Cross. And this board meets quarterly. That's why I often you know, have a report except on the sales tax revenue. So 
It's not that you're not uh, working hard, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lee. Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Trustee Ingram. Thank you, Mr. President Chair. President of the KACCT. Thank you. Um, the quarterly KACCT meeting was conducted via Zoom and was called to order on uh, August the 29th at 8 a.m. Um, we did meet, as I mentioned, Zoom. That was kind of a last minute decision, um, basically just because of the pandemic. So that's what we did. Um, we did extend appreciation to Pratt Community College for being willing to host the meeting, but again, reminded everyone uh, that due to the existing pandemic conditions, it was decided to meet via Zoom. Highlights included uh, Treasurer David Marshall from Hutch Community College provided an update on our finances. He shared that the organization had been awarded a Paycheck Protection Loan grant since the last quarterly meeting. However, uh, it was found during the annual audit, it was pointed out that KACCT did not actually qualify for this grant, so those funds were returned. David also reported on the recent audit, stating it found the organization to be financially sound. He suggested consideration be given to alternating the annual audit with an accountant review as a means of cutting costs. It's a little bit into the weeds, something I typically would not have provided, but I think it is important information. Heather called upon the membership to be especially aware of a couple of line item changes in the budget. Um, again, one was for the sale of the office furniture. I think everyone remembers that KACCT no longer has the office that we have maintained. We have a smaller office um, in an effort to reduce cost. And the other change was from telephone services, and that was for a, a stipend for our executive director. Heather apprised the membership of the forthcoming election of officers this December. She asked that anyone interested in running for a KACCT office, please contact her. She did add that the current members of the executive committee would be willing to remain in their respective positions for another year. Typically, it is a two-year cycle, and so that would just be consistent with what we have done in the past. Heather reported on a recent marketing campaign which showed the results of advertising done on a variety of social media avenues. She noted this had been a successful venture and could prove to be a better way for promoting the value of community colleges. Regarding legislative matters, Heather reported it is unlikely Governor Kelly will be doing any more allotments for the remainder of the year, which means no more cuts to higher ed. She added that due to COVID-19, there is a $800 to $900 million hole in the current state budget. Heather also apprised the group of her recent request to the Kansas governor and legislature of no cuts to higher education funding. She informed the group that Governor Kelly had vetoed the Promise Act bill, but that the legislature continues to work on getting it passed. She also presented and explained a chart showing the distribution of CARES and SPARC funding to the community colleges. She added there could be additional funds from the federal government and reminded everyone that such funds have to be distributed by the end of 2020. She also spoke to the group about House Bill 2016, which could provide liability protection to community colleges against possible lawsuits resulting from students contacting COVID-19 while on campus. Uh, the following is a reflection of Heather's viewpoints regarding the legislative priorities and positions affecting KACCT. Possible points of interest of the 2021 legislature will be amending the Management Emergency Act and dealing with the recovery from the pandemic. We continue to seek funding, full funding for SB 155 and our CTE, the Career Tech Ed, work on improving the transfer of credits to four-year institutions, the full funding of CAPERS, and the reconsideration of funding for high-wage, high-demand jobs. Heather informed the group that the Department of Commerce was offering grants as was the IT consortium. Grant applications had to be submitted by September 4th and she strongly encouraged the community colleges to reach out to their respective legislators and invite them for campus visitors, visits as a means of informing them of the community college needs and concerns. Uh, there was a reminder of the annual ACCT conference that will be presented virtually this year. It is October 5th through the 8th. Uh, Heather also then had me do a short report on the future of higher ed council as Dick uh, mentioned we don't meet until this coming Tuesday, so I, re, um, I had already provided a, a report to you all last month, but I just kind of give, gave some highlights of that. Um, particularly, we noted the um, looking at the equity gaps and the ease of transfer in particular, and then the lack of completion of FAFSA by high school students as concerns that we are, are looking at addressing. 
Uh, let me see. Heather then opened the meeting for a trustee roundtable, but when no interest was expressed, we did find a motion to adjourn. Um, I think we have found that in doing the, the Zoom meetings, it's great to have everyone on board. We had all 19 presidents, and we had representatives from all 19 community colleges. Um, but there just isn't the interaction that we would normally have. So we have not done the education that we normally would be doing at those quarterly meetings and basically finished in about an hour and a half. So much more short and much more abbreviated, but uh, still important to get the group together. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, questions in the chamber for Trustee Ingram? Seeing none, Trustee Cross? None, Trustee Lawson? Okay, if not, we'll move on to the Johnson County Community College Foundation, and our liaison there is Trustee Ingram. Yes, thank you. Uh, the foundation hosted a member social on Thursday, August the 27th. In yet another example of a successful pivot during those challenging times, the event was held online. More than 30 foundation members had the opportunity to virtually gather to hear from President Bound as well as JCCC's Assistant Dean of Athletics and Athletics Director, Randy Stange. President Bound discussed his 90-day plan and thoughts on working closely with the foundation and its members, and Mr. Stange provided a great update on JCCC athletics. The social concluded with a question and answer session. We appreciate all the foundation members who participated and would especially like to thank Jim Dice and Patty McGraw from Athletics and Jason Brunken and Adrian Swan from Audiovisual Services for helping make the event possible. I believe it was rain that caused, was it the weather that caused that to be moved? It was actually a couple of COVID, po positive COVID okay. tests, I think, I, I, among athletes. I couldn't that... remember, and I thought, you know, it was, it was a quick pivot, though, so we quick appreciate their, their efforts. The year of flexibility continues within the foundation. Earlier this month, the foundation typically would have hosted its annual scholarship celebration, recognizing hundreds of JCCC students who have received foundation-funded scholarships. For a variety of reasons, we felt early September was not the right time this year to invite our students to such an event. We are excited to announce that this event is being moved to the spring semester and will be held on Monday, April 12, 2021 at noon. We feel moving this event to the spring semester will allow more students to participate and provide a great opportunity to celebrate a successful academic year for more of our scholarship winners. The foundation has multiple meetings coming up in the next two weeks, including our next Sum Enchanted Opportunity Committee meeting on Thursday, September the 24th, and our first Foundation Board of Directors meeting of the new year on Wednesday, September 30th. Both of these meetings will be held via Zoom. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, the foundation has been very active, despite the fact that we're all um, virtual. It's been exactly. interesting to watch. Uh, questions for Trustee Ingram on the foundation? I see none in the chambers. Uh, Trustee Cross has none. Trustee Lawson? Anything on the foundation? If not, we'll move into Learning Quality Committee. Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, Learning Quality Committee met on September 8th with a plethora of participants, uh, including Trustee Smith Everett and myself. I think Trustee Cross was traveling. Um, we really had a full agenda. We met almost two hours, and uh, we started off with a report uh, on the police academy from Ken Sissom. And uh, I, I just, you know, I've been on this board now 11 years, and it was really uh, refreshing to have an update on our police academy in light of some of the current issues going on around the country. Uh, that our police academy began in 1972, uh, so it's been serving the police departments of Johnson County Community College for uh, almost as long as the college is old, and um, works very closely under the auspices of the Kansas Law Enforcement Agency, as well as our um, Johnson County District Attorney, as well as the police chiefs from all of the police departments within Johnson County. And um, uh, there are about 120 course offerings uh, that cadets, I shouldn't use the word cadets, many of these uh, students are, are law enforcement folks already. Uh, but there are, uh, they have an opportunity for 120 courses. The, uh, 
some of the discussion based around what's going on around the country today in, in, in relationship to how can the police academy make adjustments to course offerings. And two areas that of concern are fair and impartial policing these days. And, and a second area is, is our officers trained in de-escalating of uh, protest movements. How do we de-escalate a situation? And uh, Ken Sissoms did a terrific job in explaining that we're actually ahead of the norm at the state level and national level with the training that we're doing. But a lot of the um, input comes in from our police chiefs and through the Kansas Law Enforcement Agency. Uh, and, and I'm just really pleased uh, and proud of what our campus does to help not just train new officers going on the scene. Uh, and, I, and I think I, I, I asked, I'm not sure if I wrote down the question, but there are, I wanna say, uh, there's just a large number of police officers in Johnson County. So the question was, how are they updated and trained? And the academy uh, through Ken also does a lot of one-on-one -on -one coursework with police departments uh, as that police department has a need. Uh, I, I consider it somewhat like the uh, fire training department that Overland Park, the city of Overland Park provides for a number of uh, fire departments around the country. So I'm really, really pleased about the good work that our, uh, that our police academy does in the training of officers, particularly uh, at this time when there's a lot of tension around the country. Um, then we had an update on Crush the Vote with, uh, uh, led by uh, Tara Karim, and I was pleased that Mr. Russ, uh, Russell called this evening and was on our, one of our speakers. He's on the committee, by the way, and there's a committee comprised of several folks. Trustees Musil and Lawson uh, represent our board on Crush the Vote. Uh, there are faculty members on it, several students on it, and uh, they, there are a number of strategies put in place. Uh, I would remind us that a year ago, or in 2016, I think our voting rate of students was 51.9%, uh, almost 52%. Registration rate was uh, almost 74%, but the Crush the Vote Committee has a goal to increase both of those, and uh, strategies are in place to see that, that we can do whatever we can to help that. And uh, uh, so I really I want to applaud the committee uh, on, on awareness of voting and the steps that need to be taken to make sure that their vote counts. Uh, then we had a, uh, a very interesting program that was uh, led by Debbie Rulo on a partnership bridging the gap between offenders and the community. And uh, I, I think that each of the board members uh, received that uh, detailed report in, in, uh, previously when, when the committee uh, agenda goes out. And we have a close partnership with N-Circle, which was formerly called Cultivate Inc. And uh, this is a not-for-profit organization that helps work with incarcerated folks uh, to give them another chance. And uh, uh, Debbie and her team are doing just a terrific job uh, of involving the college. Uh, the foundation has contributed uh, recently $25,000 in scholarship monies, which I think serves about 63 incarcerated folks. Um, working through our adult uh, uh, center here in Johnson County and uh, offering courses and basic, basically some career and tech ed courses. She gave the example of one young lady who has become pretty masterful at welding and now wants to become a counselor to help others. Uh, Debbie gave some really um, uh, good numbers in terms of, and, and that's in their report, uh, but she talked about that there are 2.3 million Americans incarcerated in a year. 75% um, of formerly incarcerated individuals will remain unemployed one year after they are released. So nationally, our, the success rate of incarcerated folks getting a second chance <clears throat> is not as good as we'd like to think it is. But um, uh, the, the, the folks that come through our program uh, show a lot stronger sustainability and endurance. And so I'm just really, really pleased uh, about uh, how uh, our, our college is, is working with these folks. Uh, Dr. Bowen uh, made a uh, support, supportive comment about it as well and has some experience uh, in working with incarcerated. Um, Debbie had reported that uh, after 90 days of successful completion of, the, of, the, of their work with the college, 78% of the students are still employed, 81% are at the same employer, and 93% are in the same field. So 
uh, we, we can be feeling pretty good about the success rate we have <coughs> of students uh, who, who come through our program and, and find, find a, a new journey in, in their pathway. So uh, I, I want to commend Debbie and, and the whole team, and hopefully we can find ways to even expand programs, perhaps to Lansing and Leavenworth, uh, and, um, and uh, help these folks who at one point in their life made a bad decision and now we're finding a way to uh, uh, restart their lives. Uh, then we, uh, and those three, those three presentations really were most interesting and, 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 and took on some time. We also had a, um, a report from Gerbishan on a curriculum, uh, and I think those, those recommendations are found in the, in the uh, consent agenda. So with that, uh, I, I certainly, uh, don't want to shortchange the importance of those three reports. And the Trustee Laura Smith Everett, you were engaged. Uh, in fact, the Trustee Everett is, is Smith Everett ha has a full time job. And after the first presentation, she indicated that she would have to leave the meeting and go to work. And uh, yet she hung on for the two hours and uh, or almost. <laughs> and uh, Laura, do you have any comments you'd like to make? No, I, I would just echo many of your same sentiments. I thought. Uh, each of the presentations just highlighted the diverse things we do uh, here are to support our community and um, the ways in which we have excellent faculty and staff um, doing those things that are important to our community. And I, I believe if I'm, was that the first day of school? I think it was. I think the, yeah, yeah it was my first day of school. I'm a K-12 educator. And um, I told myself that I would just stay and I just couldn't because each of the programs were and presentations were um, really incredible and I feel like every um, every month I learn more and more about what we do to support our community and I very much appreciate it. So that concludes my comments. Questions from other board members about learning quality? Um, I did, I know Trustee Smith ever you brought up when we did our advisory committees um, including a broader group of persons on the uh, advisory committee to the to the police academy. Did that was that addressed at all, or okay, I think we need to keep. I need yeah, to, that was that was the only thing that I realized afterwards. I did not um, ask that I wish I would have. Yeah. And and he spoke to why a lot of that is because they they have they are guided by um, the state law enforcement regulations. But I do think there is something to be said about expanding that advisory committee to hear more voices. I think there are mandatory positions that have to be on it, yes. but I don't think that precludes us from expanding it, or at least having an advisory board. I thought your idea was very good on that. I think Lee wants to say something. I think Lee wants to say something. Oh, Lee, did you have a comment? Trustee Cross. Yes, Mr. Chair, th thank you. I think thank that was Randy. Um, I, I was traveling and in the unusual position of having an in-person trial last week in Central Missouri and Columbia. So I apologize I wasn't there. The, the committee means a lot to me, and I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for your, both of you, for your reports. Thank you, Lee. Um, moving on to the Management Committee then, it's Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Management Committee report is found on pages 6 to 16 of your board packet. And again, uh, we had a very ambitious agenda and an outstanding, uh, uh, some outstanding presentations. Uh, Dr. Jay Antel, uh, college's executive director for the Center of Sustainability, gave a detailed report on where the college is in our sustainability efforts, uh, really emphasizing our, co our college power switch program, uh, our, our commitment to solar energy, uh, where we are on recycling. Uh, it, it was just a very detailed, uh, well-presented program. And if you haven't had a chance, I, I also believe you have some of the, the detail of that uh, that goes through the agenda when it goes out to the management committee. Um, we have a very ambitious goal on both recycling and energy to be, um, um, I, I believe it was 20, I'm, I'm, I don't have my note in front of me on that, so I'm a little bit at risk, but it was either 2030 or 2050 where we want to be 100% sustainable. And uh, Jay and his team are, are, and by the way, the students are heavily involved with, with, our, with our, all of our efforts on sustainability. Um, I, I would remiss to say that if I didn't talk a little bit about the bird migrating uh, study, uh, we have a, a few square feet of glass uh, on our buildings, and uh, sometimes the, the solar, I'm sorry, the, uh, 
the sonar uh, system of birds uh, don't take into consideration the glass uh, in time to prevent a collision. But uh, the bird collision study has a number of dots placed, and I'm not going to give this justice, but uh, there are panels of these dots where they can, they can determine the kind of bird, uh, how it hit, what happened, and it's a really detailed. We're, we're part of a, uh, um, a, a team of folks around the country that study bird migration. And um, as you know, Kansas is, is a, really a center spot for bird migration, particularly on the western side of Kansas. But it was just fascinating to uh, hear that we can tell if it's a dove or a robin or uh, whatever it is uh, coming through uh, our community and, and running into our windows and how we can help prevent uh, detracting birds uh, from, from those collisions. Anyway, uh, probably a 45 to 50 minute presentation by Jay himself on, on all of our sustainability efforts. Uh, Dr. Weber gave a, uh, who's our interim executive vice president in finance and administration services, um, presented information on agreements related to our transportation program and truck driving uh, training program. That's found on page 37 of your packet. I won't go into the detail of that, but again, another program that's very important. Rachel Lears, uh, associate vice president of financial services. Um, uh, updated the committee on the year-end audit for fiscal year 2019-20 and uh, the initial planning for next year's fiscal year 21-22 uh, budget process. So we've just kind of adopted a budget and uh, now we're beginning the, the planning process uh, here for the 21-22 budget. Uh, Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President of Business Services, uh, presented the single source purchase report. That can be found on page 8. Uh, Tom Hall, uh, Vice President of Campus Services, gave the monthly update on capital infrastructure. That report is found on page 12 and 13 of your packet, and he also reviewed the report of the financial status on our facilities master plan projects, and you know they're, they're pretty much coming to a closure now, and you can find that detailed report on page 14 of your report. We do have uh, three recommendations for action tonight. Uh, the first recommendation is for a single source purchase with CDW for network storage infrastructure. Uh, this is a pre-approved to meet student em emergent needs. We've had to move ahead uh, on this particular issue, so we're asking for board approval tonight with that action we had to take. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for the fiscal year 21 amount for CDW for a total amount of $332,100, and I'll make that motion. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the single source purchase report for CDW, which is actually, I guess, a ratification of items that we had to do. I'd note that the money of 332000 came through the CARES Act. Um, so sometimes we wonder where that two plus trillion dollars went. Part of it is being used for us so we can teach our students and have the kind of IT resources that we need. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, nay. And Trustee Cross and Trustee Lawson, if I don't hear uh, a no from you, I'm going to assume it is a yes vote, and we will call that a unanimous vote. So please correct me if you, if, uh, you are voting nay. Thank you. Mr. Uh, the next, next single source recommendation is with Marsh USA for property insurance. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for fiscal year 21 amount for Marsh USA for a total amount of $297,339, and I'll make that motion. Second. Right. Moved and seconded to approve the, uh, the uh, recommendation to approve the single source justification for FY21 amount for Marsh USA Insurance Risk Management, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Opposed, nay. That motion passes unanimously. Regarding uh, business services, we have a recommendation based on a bid for Panasonic projectors, which is in your packet. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the low bid from B&H Photo for request for bid RFB 21-009 Panasonic projectors in the amount of $160,806.28, and I'll make that motion. Second. 
and moved and seconded to approve the recommendation of the low bid from B&H Photo for, for Panasonic projectors. I'll note those are for the Hudson Auditorium, the boardroom, the Craig Auditorium, CC211, and 62 other classrooms. So the number of 160,000 covers an awful lot of uh, rooms on campus. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Oh. Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just make one closing comment. I've, I've gone through the learning quality rather, rather quickly and the management, and, and I think for the viewing audience uh, and perhaps even for uh, those of us as board members, there, there are just many, many, many programs and activities going on on this campus every day, every week uh, that benefit our community. And uh, I'm not sure that the community totally understands the broad range of how we reach out to the community, whether it's the police academy, early childhood education, the culinary academy. Some of these programs uh, receive a little more publicity by their nature. But this college uh, is kind of the heartbeat, and not kind of, it is the heartbeat of teaching and learning uh, for residents of this county and beyond. Uh, I appreciated Mr. Liker's comments tonight uh, from the Faculty Association about the amount of effort it takes to go through to make adjustments uh, when times are difficult, like we're facing with this COVID-19. But I, I just want the community to understand that uh, the tentacles of this campus reach throughout and touch the lives of many, many people in a really positive way. And I sometimes go through reports too quickly to broadcast that the, the way it deserves. So I just wanted to share that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to the treasurer's report uh, under President's recommendations for action. Trustee Cross as our treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the board treasurer's report can be found in the board packet. Let me pull it up. I was engrossed in uh, Trustee Cook's reports. Yes, thank you. Um, the board packet does include the treasurer's report for the month ended July 31st, 2020. Some items of note include uh, at page one is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. July was the first month of the college's 2020-2021 fiscal year. Uh, the state grant payment for the fall semester of 11.4 million was received in July. College's general fund unencumbered cash balance was 98.6 million as of July 31st. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. That's what Rachel Lears tells me. Uh, so it is uh, the recommendation, Mr. Chair, of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month end of July 31st, 2020, subject to audit and ISO move. There a second. second. It's been moved, um, and I'm not doing what I was supposed to do, Ms. Schlisch. Moved by uh, Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Ingram to uh, approve the Treasurer's Report for July 31, 2020, subject to audit. Is there any discussion? None in the chambers. Uh, Trustee Cross has spoken. Trustee Lawson, do you have any questions on the Treasurer's Report? No, Mr. Chair. Thank you. If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, no. That motion carries unanimously. Mr. Thank Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Treasurer Trustee. Uh, now we're ready for Dr. Bounds' monthly report to the board. All right. We'll try to get engrossed. Uh, Chairman Musil, trustees, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide you with a college update uh, tonight. Uh, before I jump into the, um, the uh, content, most of the content of my uh, report today, um, I, I would like to uh, draw attention that beginning next month, you will see the Student Senate report, um, that as the school year uh, commences um, and we get things up and running, um, we'll be ready to go in October uh, with, I believe, Sailor Usher will be uh, providing you with an update at that time. So. 
Let me start out by saying, and let's see if we're going to uh, bring up the report. There, you there go. we go. Um, we are off to a, a really solid start uh, for the semester, and I want to, to thank our faculty and staff uh, for the tremendous job they've done at launching the school year. Um, we are um, uh, well into the semester now um, and uh, moving forward uh, very nicely. As you know, and for the listening audience, uh, we're about 80% online and 20% face-to-face this semester. Um, in addition to that, um, we are, uh, if you look at the sections taught, um, we're about about 54% of our sections are taught by full-time faculty and 46% taught by adjunct faculty. And I just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the critical role that our faculty play, obviously, in providing exceptional instruction. A part of that, an important part of that, are adjunct faculty. Um, and so um, I just wanted to remind us and our audience of the critical role that adjunct faculty play. Um, uh, at times, we hear concerns raised about um, uh, from adjunct faculty about uh, compensation and, and other things. I want to remind us that, um, I, first of all, from my perspective, having had the chance to teach as an adjunct faculty member for, the, for about 12 years, um, I am incredibly uh, appreciative of those who uh, balance both full-time and other employment uh, along with teaching. Uh, that does not in any way diminish the critical role that our full-time faculty play. Um, but I am uh, pleased to say that um, if you look at our adjunct faculty uh, relationship, um, uh, compensation-wise, uh, we pay very well um, compared to the other colleges uh, in uh, the region and across the state. Um, we do provide and have expectations around training. Um, and, and again, the primary reason for that is ensuring that our students are receiving um, the highest quality um, educational experience that they can have. Um, and so again, thank you to our um, adjunct faculty and our, to our full-time faculty. Our COVID uh, protocols are working. Um, we are not seeing uh, cases coming to campus and, and spreading across campus. Our team has done a very good job of, of uh, managing through those situations to provide the safest possible environment um, for our students to learn and our faculty and staff to serve. And again, I want to say thank you so much um, for that work. A reminder that uh, this week uh, we launched the um, DEI survey. Um, is a, a, the next step in the DEI assessment work that we wanted to do this year. Uh, and I'm appreciative of the DEI task force um, and our colleagues at MGT Consulting in helping us do that. Um, before I get into enrollment, I want to talk about maybe one quick highlight um, from the start of this semester. Um, uh, early this week, on Monday, um, we hosted um, a a conference for innovators um, across the state of Kansas uh, through the Kansas Small Business Development Center. And for the past four years, we've hosted the conference uh, called Encountering Innovation. And it's an opportunity for innovators to get together with um, tech scouts and investors and the public to get a chance to see that the innovations that these folks have developed, um, and, and there are folks from NASA, um, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, the U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command, the FBI, uh, the Corps of Engineer, Army Corps of Engineer, um, just tremendous uh, opportunities for folks to, to showcase um, their excellent innovations. And I want to thank uh, Jessica Johnson uh, and Valerie Reese, um, who uh, lead our SBDC efforts here on campus um, for their fine work. All right, so that's all the good news. Lots of good stuff going on. And we're serving um, you know, students incredibly well here on campus. But there aren't as many students on campus, I mean, either literally because of our move to an 80% online environment, um, but our enrollment is down. Um, and that is heavily uh, influenced by, um, frankly, by our College Now student population. Um, if we look at... Um, 
uh, the report here, and this is a report that I believe you see, receive each week. Um, we were, uh, as of uh, yesterday, we were down 19 percent um, in terms of headcount um, and 15 percent um, in uh, credit hours. Um, it, it's tough to read that chart. I realize that um, the the highlights are well. The major points in this are the 19% down in headcount and 15% down in credit hours. Um, it inched up a, a little or inched downward a little bit more uh, in the last 24 hours to about 20% um, and 16%. Um, what's significant in that is, is that the, the delay with the delay of the start of school year um, of our high school students enrolling in College Now classes. Each year we'd have about 4,000 students who enroll through College Now. Um, and so um, certainly we've got about uh, 417 students-ish enrolled um, as College Now students. That's about 21, 2200 students, fewer than what we had at this point last year, and about 3,600 fewer than at Census. Um, when we look at, at the College Now students, um, there are examples of, of, that we're seeing uh, with Dr. McLeod and, and uh, doc, Dr. Maupin working through um, with our K-12 uh, colleagues in finding creative ways to do that. We think um, specifically of uh, Shawnee Mission Schools and the plan to move from virtual to face-to-face -face, um, and, and back we, to virtual and back. And back. <laughs> it's like watching a tennis match, mm -hmm. which, right? And so. You should be in it. <laughs> oh, I haven't played in a long time. So um, anyways, um, when, when we look at that move and the impact that has, so one of the things that they've done that's uh, very proactive is looking at the, the, where they have the properly credentialed faculty um, to teach so they've gone to, for example, a class that would have multiple high schools feeding this class with one teacher. That's great when you're in an online environment. When you move back to face-to-face, -to -face, that begins to create some complications when you think about master agreements and so forth. Well, they worked um, very closely with our team to come up with a creative solution, um, and they're actually going to stay, as I understand, they're going to stay in that virtual environment for the College Now class. Works out well for everybody. I can't say that every um, uh, school district, every high school has ended up in that same place. Um, and so the big question as we move forward in these next couple of weeks is gonna be what does um, College Now enrollment um, look like? Uh, so it's, it's one that we continue to work at very um, assertively um, and uh, ex still expect to have strong numbers from a College Now perspective. Transfer students are flat. Um, in terms of the number of, of uh, transfer students, that's uh, good news. When you think about how do we stack up against others, um, if we look at the, the broader metro area, um, uh, others are down 17 to 20 percent, kind of in that range. Um, if we look across the state, um, the average is about uh, 14 percent down, but again, it's kind of in that 10 to 20. It's a big, uh, a big range. And then nationally, uh, community colleges, um, are down about 11% or so. So um, we anticipate um, as a leadership team that by the end of the semester, once everything washes out, we get all of our College Now students in, we look at late starting classes and so forth, um, we still believe uh, that we'll be down somewhere in the 5 to 8% range, but not where we are today um, at a 19-20% a, a range. Okay. Um, quick update in terms of the Carlson Center. Thought it might be good um, to get a quick update there. Um, it, the work that's happening now is, is, is really the design work and looking at the logo and branding work and preparing a campaign uh, for when we make that full transition. Another big focus for right now is on external signage. Um, the permanent external signage uh, that will be um, outside, obviously outside the building. Um, and, and that work is happening now um, with substantial completion in early December. All with the idea of a December, January rollout of uh, <laughs> our performing arts center venue 
under, under its new name. Um, carrying on and piggy, piggybacking off of that, if you will, um, the foundation uh, will start a campaign they're anticipating after the first of the year um, that will um, focus in on a performance arts uh, membership campaign. So uh, taking and um, using that as a launching point uh, to move forward. In addition, uh, shared governance. Um, it's one of the things that we've been talking about for some time. Uh, it was a high priority on my 90-day plan. Um, much work has been done uh, in the last year, um, uh, thanks to the work uh, that led to uh, the Academic Branch Council, to the work of the task force. They've been looking at a college-wide council. Um, uh, the cabinet considered it um, in the spring and was supportive of the model that was proposed. Um, and so we've had a chance now in the last few weeks to, to really begin to wrestle through what does that look like. Um, I am uh, incredibly thankful to Sherry Barrett for coming in and providing kind of that snapshot looking back and how about moving forward. Um, and that led to the decision um, of a, an affirmation of the plan as it was developed to move forward with a college council this fall. Um, so this is uh, news to our entire uh, college community uh, that we believe we're ready to move forward with a uh, college council. Um, the next steps will include identifying the actual participants that will make that up. Um, uh, that group then will be tasked with uh, developing uh, bylaws in terms of how they will operate and so forth. Um, and then uh, parallel to that, forming a task force that will look at what might a staff council look like. Um, and there's been lots of thoughts and consideration around that. And back up just a second and say that the purpose of this shared governance council um, is really to ensure that we have an inclusive, transparent dialogue around issues facing the campus. Um, we made up of a representative group um, and have the opportunity. It's not a decision-making body, but it is a vehicle for communication, a vehicle for uh, the flow of information, of identifying uh, where there may be concerns um, or where may attention may need, more attention may need to be focused. Um, and then that group would be really tasked with directing it, redirecting that effort to the appropriate team or area of the college that needs to focus in on it. So I want to say thank you to the team that's worked so hard on this uh, to get us to this point. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to, to implement the next phase of uh, shared governance here at Johnson County Community College. And then finally in my report uh, this evening, um, I said uh, last time when we met that I'd provide a little bit more detail around the strategic planning process. Um, we are working right now to uh, finalize a strategic planning council, which is a group of uh, faculty and staff from around the college um, who's tasked with ensuring that the collaborative process that we've identified for the strategic planning process is lived out, that that employee, community, trustee, uh, foundation uh, voice is heard and recognized in the work as it moves forward. And so um, as we move through this, this is really between now and um, next spring, the iterative process that we would go through that would result in bringing a plan that you will touch and be engaged with along the way as trustees, but brings forth a plan for you in the spring um, for your support. Um, and then from there, um, it would drive um, the uh, work around action planning that really focuses in on what does next year look like, but builds that framework for a five-year plan that allows us to move forward with intentionality um, as a college. And with that, that concludes my report. I'll ask for questions, but first, I always, and I know you're new, but I always have to ask what at what acronym means, so DEI means? Thank you very much. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So not, not thank you. familiar with I that term. Yep. I think it's important. Um, thank you. Um, questions for Dr. Bown from the chamber? Trustee Smith-Everett. 
Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Bound, thank you very much for your report. Maybe perhaps for this tired brain, thank you most of all for it being very visual, which makes it easier <laughs> for me to process these days. A um, couple of questions for you. So our average is 4,000, you said, um, students who usually enroll in college now. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? So my question is, and this may be better for somebody who is willing to do some math on their feet, is what percentage of our student body would that be right now? If we're down 19%, 4,000, let's say we, we meet that again this year, about what would it be? Anybody have a about calculator? 20% of our credit hours, right? Uh, normally it would be, it would be hour, about 20% right. of our student population is college now students. Right, but I'm asking if... Now what does that equate yes. to? See, I see. have to take my shoes off to get there. Okay. So, um, But we'll get an answer for it. That's that's one of my questions, if yep. that um, gets us back up to a full 19, 20% or not. Um, and then I've actually had a series of neighbors who've asked me specifically about this. I think for some families, this is one of the few things they know about JCCC that we do college now. And so it sounds like there is an ongoing, or you worked out sort of an agreement with Shawnee Mission mm -hmm. and with other uh, K-12 uh, partners that is each individual ways to do college now. And in other words, there's going to be multiple uh, approaches. I'm going to invite uh, yeah, Dr. McLeod. Dr. Dr. McLeod, would you... Come to the podium. Sorry. <laughs> Got his cyclone mask on. Always. Uh, socks to match. We, <laughs> we are, uh, we're, we're always working on what our standard model is, and we try to deploy the standard model first and then figure out if there must be workarounds. In this particular instance, we had to look at ways to. Um, to, to house an online type of course to make sure that the students were still uh, able to connect with an instructor who had the appropriate qualifications for us to count the credits mm -hmm. in that particular instance. Uh, and we have similar meetings with each school district to see whether they can continue on in our current arrangement or if we need to try and find ways for us to be flexible to meet them because they are having struggles with, with either you know, um, ill or missing staff or um, uh, staff that has transitioned from one building to another and so a certain offering is not available where it used to be and so it, it right now there's lots of moving pieces but we do work individually with each district to try and suit, meet their needs as best we can within our general structure okay. stay right there yep. because my follow-up question is so typically, my understanding is when we, when we talk or advertise college now, we do it through the K-12 system. And that would be, I mean, you, I've seen the posters up in high schools, and we also would do it through the teachers. With this pandemic, and specifically just speaking from the K-12 standpoint, there is so much information coming to us from schools in all these different ways that, frankly, as a parent, it's overwhelming as a faculty member. It is overwhelming, and I wondered if we would also think along these college now lines of maybe a different strategy to attract students once we've figured out what it would look like for them that would be able to go directly to families in case the school district, it just gets lost in the crazy amount of information coming out from the It is something that we consider a along with our, our K-12 partners. We, we always try to make sure that we stay within the purview of what their counselors can handle mm -hmm. because we never want to advertise or advise a student to take a course that is going to hinder their graduation right. on the high school side because they did not understand that they already had a certain credit and, was, and were missing something else. So we always try to make sure that we stay inside the framework of working with the counseling staffs within the school district so that we don't inadvertently hinder somebody mm -hmm. in our you know, zeal to help them get ahead, we wind up with them behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that was, I think, for the college now, that was my, those are my two big questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McLeod. Did you have other questions? Yeah, of course. <laughs> please, please, we'll exhaust um, them, exhaust them. <laughs> The College Council, uh, my only question was, you, you mentioned that there will be a move to a staff council. Is it um, 
you said the college council will begin meeting this fall mm -hmm. and with the idea that we would then create and work on a staff council at a later date is that something that will be going on at the same time yes. or will one be done first and then you'll start on the other so the way i see it and i think the way we would intend for this to work is that the college council will get launched this fall and we will um, form a group building on the group that worked last year in terms of what would a staff council look like. So I think there'll need to be an additional task force um, that really is, is focused on that. And there are lots of different ways um, that we could look at it from a staff council standpoint. Um, but, you know, certainly you could look at and say all staff, um, or you could look and, you know, just to create two examples, all staff um, or subsets of staff, depending on what uh, classification, if you will, that they're in. Um, or you, you could look, another way to look at it would be, do you look at it by branch? Um, so there are a number of ways to look at it. Um, and so that's what the group would be tasked for. Um, but also to make sure, just as we built on uh, the academic side and in, in creating an opportunity for voice and shared governance, um, we need to really look at that from an overall, uh, from a staff standpoint as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's my, my questions are exhausted. Thank you. And I am too. Uh, other questions in count in the chambers? Uh, Trustee Lawson, do you have questions for Dr. Bound? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you for calling on me. Mr. President, earlier last week, I was proud to send you and the head of our faculty association the published work by the National Association of Community College of Trustees. We refer to that as ACCT. Uh -huh. uh, the diversity, equity, inclusion policy, which was a checklist and an implementation guide for community college boards. In my time serving on that DEI National Committee, I was glad to be a part of the working of this effort. And I have continued to follow it all the way through. It was decided, of course, uh, in 2018 on our first conference call at the National Committee to move ahead and create that actual guide for this. And in 2019, the work was largely finished. I know seeing it come to fruition and finally being in the hands, of course, among a lot of elected officials across the nation, and of course, many large business owners moving our culture forward, it is something that I hope gives a lot of our board a starting place where we go uh, with DEI and of course, Dr. Bound, you added belonging. How can we utilize this guide? Again, I think um, when, when the uh, internal assessment work is done um, for faculty, staff, and students to participate in, um, and, and we have the results of that survey, we take that together with, um, I, I would very much look at the ACCT guide um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and ask that the task force that takes all of that information um, and helps us move forward, um, I think that uh, that resource, that tool, uh, would be very helpful to us in the process. Thank you so much. Trustee Cross, questions? Yes, uh, I believe my colleagues have uh, added or covered many of my concerns. I think the only thing I would ha add is, um, really just stressing the need for leadership to be included. Um, I think it's critical that um, groups that are um, historically been locked out of uh, equity or efficacy, that they, they um, have access to and uh, a full um, participation in uh, leadership. And I got a brother in the Navy who, um, all the time talks about uh, the unity of command and how from uh, really Washington forward that the success of the United States has been uh, founded upon the unity of command and that um, uh, you know the civil power is superior to the military and so that it all focuses in on one person and I think for us that goes to Dr. Bown and, and, and or the chair of our board and uh, just teaching that principle. I've struggled with it in my own uh, life and, and understanding of the concept of leadership. I thought it was a nebulous concept that other private for-profit institutions were profiting off of. But I think that adding L to uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, calling it a dial committee would be good. 
And with that, I, I'm I, like Trustee Lawson and thrilled with uh, not all my colleagues. I know I know all of you fairly well, except Trustee Snyder. I don't know him very well, but uh, I like him. And so uh, I, I think all of us are open to this and, and certainly proud that our institution is, is taking these steps. So I, I commend you, Dr. Bound, and I thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes my comments. All right, um, the next item on the agenda is new business um, and an update on the board retreat, and I'll let Dr. Bound start that. All right. Well, again, uh, as you know, we've been working on uh, planning for retreats uh, yet this fall. Um, uh, and we've landed on October 17 and, and November, November 21 uh, as the two dates. And then the use of the ACCT board assessment tools um, in, uh, in between those two um, events. Um, we have approached, um, and she has agreed, um, uh, we have approached uh, Dr. Mary Spildy. Um, she is the President Emeritus of Lane Community College, uh, where she served president for 16 years, um, a, a national expert um, in terms of uh, community colleges, workforce development, leadership development, and sustainability. Um, she serves um, as a leadership coach for Achieving the Dream. Um, and has worked with many different community colleges around the country, um, uh, working with boards uh, and their president um, uh, to move forward successfully uh, as, a, as a team. Uh, in addition to that, uh, she would bring with her uh, Ken Burke, um, who has served, had served for 11 years uh, as a trustee at St. Petersburg College in Florida. Um, he's been a part of the ACCT board, um, having served as chair, um, and currently chair chairs the Florida Higher Education Coordinating Council. Um, the two of them uh, will be reaching out to you, if they haven't already, um, to find time to spend, uh, if you will, one-on-one, -on -one, although I guess it's two-on-one -on -one conversation time, um, in kind of setting the stage and getting your sense of what uh, your expectations and desires are. Um, for the retreat so that when we build an agenda, it's based on our collective input as opposed to her coming in or them coming in with a, a canned uh, agenda. Um, I, I will say that in the process, um, uh, I worked with AACC, excuse me, the American Association of Community College Trust, uh, American Association of Community Colleges and the uh, Association of uh, American Oh, what's ACCT? American just, Community Trustees. American Association Community, Community, Association Community Trustees. College Trustees. Thank you. Um, uh, to identify potential uh, facilitators, uh, started with three, got proposals from two, um, and uh, based on the references um, and experience, um, have brought forward uh, Dr. Mary Spildy and uh, Ken Burke. Um, the cost of each retreat session is $3. Three, three dollars. It's a great deal. Wow. Um, I know. I, it's amazing you can get them to come. But uh, for $3,000 per session plus expenses, that includes all of the prep time, like all of the time they'll spend with you, um, the facilitation and follow-up work as well, um, and the cost of the survey work is another $3,000. Um, so all told, uh, we're talking about an investment um, in us, um, uh, in, in a total of uh, 9,000 plus expenses. Um, I'm uh, very excited about their experience and what they can do um, in facilitating our work together um, uh, as we move forward uh, and happy to answer questions. Uh, questions about the retreat process? And I will tell you what I I'm concerned because I don't think we have time this fall for another, another retreat on some of the other topics we'd like to cover. Um, but we will, I, I encourage everybody to take whatever time they can uh, to be responsive when Dr. Spildy calls um, because we need to get those scheduled so that they can build this retreat customized for October 17th. So. Um, as soon as they get in touch with you, please try to respond. And please find time to uh, get on the phone with them uh, if you can. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for the work you've done so far getting this, uh, getting this scheduled. Mr. Chair, I have a comment about the... Trustee Lawson. Thank you. 
One thing, one of the things I think we will be important to really be successful in this retreat is that we have to look at things in a new perspective and move past carrying forward any personal penalties or grudges. I look forward to seeing us work on that goal together. Thank you. Um, okay, old business. I don't have any old business. I think we're ready for the consent agenda. The consent agenda is a series of items that are handled usually in one motion and one vote. They are things that have been either reviewed by the committee or are routine and administrative matters that have been reviewed and recommended by the administration. Um, is every trustee has the right to take anything off the consent agenda? Is there any item that any trustee would like to have removed from the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as published? So moved. So moved. Uh, moved by Trustee Cook, and I'm going to call second by Trustee Cross. Is that okay, Trustee Cross? I object. You were just behind. <laughs> you nipped you at the wire. Um, <laughs> any, any discussion? If not, all in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. We have no executive session, as uh, Ms. Schlicht uh, identified earlier. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Second. Trustee, Trustee Ingram moved and Trustee Cross seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Opposed, no. That motion surprisingly carries unanimously. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we are adjourned. Great.